Um, my name is Sandeep Singhal. I'm general manager of the Windows Networking Group uh, at Microsoft. Uh, my team is responsible for the networking stack in both the Windows client and Windows server operating systems. Uh, so I will be talking today uh, about IPv6 and wanted to give a little bit of perspective on IPv6 day and what we have done over the last 10 years to really prepare for IPv6 day, as well as uh, give you some insight into some of the things that we're doing now and some of the problems that we see going into the future. Um, one of the things I want to leave you with today is that we believe that IPv6 day is a huge, important event uh, for the internet community, but that it is also just a milestone on a long journey that we've been going through and that we expect to go through for the next several years. So as I said, IPv6 day is a major event for the internet. Um, it is the first time that we're really demonstrating IPv6 connectivity end-to-end, -end, from the clients to a set of back-end servers and services. I'm going to talk a little bit about the 10 years of effort that's taken to get to this point. Uh, we started actually back in 2001 looking at IPv6 and what it would take to make IPv6 successful. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and as I said, it is just the beginning. One of the things that we realized very early on is that IPv6 and IPv6 day is not just about putting up web servers and web content that connects to the internet using IPv6. But in fact, it requires a, a, a complete re-architecting of the internet. That we've actually looked at IPv6 as an end-to-end -end problem that has required changes across the entire ecosystem, whether it be hardware, software, servers, services, infrastructure, applications. Um, it has really taken a very large community effort to get to this point. We actually started looking at IPv6 back in 2001, um, when most of the world really wasn't paying a whole lot of attention to IPv6. Um, one of the things that we realized is that over the next 10 years, um, IPv6 was going to become important. Uh, we saw address depletion coming along the way. We also saw some opportunities uh, that IPv6 created, and I'll talk about those a little bit later on in my presentation. So as part of our 2001 analysis, we built a plan for how we saw an end-to-end -end solution to the IPv6 problem uh, occur, taking place, how we would prepare, help prepare the world for transition. And the way we looked at it was really in terms of three steps. Step number one was really looking at the PC. What does it take to make sure that every client on the internet is capable of communicating over v6, whether or not the internet provides v6, we wanted to make sure that every client had the ability to access IPv6 content. Number two was making sure the infrastructure and the applications were ready. It's not interesting to have clients communicate over IPv6 unless there's something for them to talk to. So we needed to make sure that the infrastructure was going to be there, that the applications were going to be there, that the servers were going to be there, that the core uh, networking infrastructure was going to actually work. I'll talk a little bit about that as well. And third came content and scenarios. How do we really take advantage of IPv6 both to deliver content and also what kinds of new capabilities can IPv6 enable for end users and enterprise customers? So we saw this as a three-step transition. Um, and I think one of the things that's interesting about IPv6 day and where we are today is that it is, in fact, the culmination of the fact that we've been able to achieve good progress in each of these different areas. So I'm going to talk first about PCs and what we did to enable IPv6 on PCs and what we have in place today. So today is IPv6 day. We believe there's an estimate of 5 million people worldwide who have some form of native IPv6 connectivity and will be accessing or able to access uh, IPv6-enabled content on the internet today. Um, five million is a small 
percentage of the overall internet community, but it's a large number of people nonetheless,、um, and it's a global number. To get there, and to even get to five million users, we had to take a bold, make a bold statement back in 2001 that it was going to be important to have ubiquitous IPv6 access to every consumer who has a PC. What we, the way we approached this was to say, okay, we're going to go ahead and provide IPv6 capability in the operating system. So we invested into providing the ability to, to turn on IPv6 on Windows XP, and then we went beyond that in Windows Vista and Windows 7 and made it part of the operating system, and in fact turned it on by default. And we received a fair amount of criticism at the time about doing this. A lot of our enterprise customers were very frustrated by the fact that IPv6 was enabled and turned on、uh, by default, even if they had not deployed IPv6 in their network. But we took the view that it was better in the long run for the client to actually have v6 enabled and ready to go, so that that did not become an impediment to IPv6 adoption. So we turned it on. We also made the decision to make it preferred. So, if you have a choice between IPv4 connectivity and IPv6 connectivity, we choose IPv6 over IPv4. And so, since Vista, we've actually been operating a dual-stack client.、Um, every Vista and Windows 7 PC,、uh, when it boots, will obtain a IPv6 linked local address. It will actually、uh, attempt to. To discover a, a way of tunneling v6 over v4,、um, and if it can get any form of native IPv6 connectivity, it will certainly prefer that over IPv4 connectivity. Okay. So, what we've been able to do is have an install base today of clients that are really ready for an IPv6-enabled world. Now I've talked about the fact that we wanted to make sure that IPv6 was actually on and available by default. That's one step. Simply implementing IPv6 was one step, but we also took a slightly broader approach. We said we not only want to have it on and enabled by default, but we want to make sure that our implementation is great.、Um, I won't say it's perfect. There are still gaps and holes, and we, we're, we're continuing to work on those. <coughs> but we wanted to take the view. That we didn't want IPv6 infrastructure capability in the client to get in the way of adoption. One thing we said is we would not compromise on parity between IPv4 and IPv6. We in fact rewrote the entire networking stack in Windows Vista to ensure that IPv4 and IPv6 would have equivalent functionality.、Um, a great example of this is that we did decide to implement DHCP/v6 in the client as well as in our DHCP server. Why? Because our enterprise customers told us that when they were that if and when they moved to IPv6, the easiest way they to deploy IPv6 was going to be to reuse the existing management practices that they already had in place. So, while stateless IPv6 is interesting and may in fact become、uh, more widely deployed over time. Our enterprise customers told us that they wanted to make sure they had a DHCP option, so they could centrally manage addresses and know what's out there,、um, so they could push out arbitrary DHCP options to every client. So we made sure that we actually didn't create a disconnect between the way people manage v4 and the way they manage v6, at least in the, for the initial initial rollouts. As part of the deployment. By enterprises, one of the things that we really looked at was what would it take to make sure that enterprises didn't view IPv6 as a compromise. We ensured that the Windows firewall supported IPv6. So, if you're deploying policy that controls who can access the PC, what applications on the PC can access what, that you have full access to IPv6 controls along with IPv4. We ensured that there are group policy controls to control IPv6 performance and behavior and activity. We provided, we ensured that all the user interfaces, both on the client and on the management infrastructure, supported IPv6. Again, the theme here was: do not compromise. Do not put customers in a position where they, if they choose to deploy IPv6, they also have to choose to lose some functionality. We wanted to make sure that that functionality was there in parallel. The last thing we realized is that 
we didn't want to have to wait. It's great to have IPv6 in the client. We also knew and heard from customers that it was going to take a long time to deploy IPv6 infrastructure. Ten years later, um, it's still the case that most customers have not deployed IPv6 infrastructure. And yet we're starting to see IPv6 content out there. So one of the things that we intentionally invested in were transition technologies. We intentionally invested in providing 6 to 4, Teredo, Isotap as deployment options for IPv6 so that we could ensure that if and when IPv6 content would become available, users could actually access that content using over existing IPv4 networks. So it was important for us to make sure that we could enable that deployment on the client to take place, enable the deployment on the server and the services to take place without waiting for all of the infrastructure pieces to be in place uh, all at once. We knew there wasn't going to be a single day when all the infrastructure was just going to magically work. So our approach here was really to provide a no compromises solution for v4 to v6 migration, as well as ensure that the enterprises could really deploy IPv6 safely securely within their own existing management practices, and again, without having to upgrade everything. It actually turns out that the software in the PC is only a small portion of what it takes to deploy IPv6. Um, we've actually done a fair amount of work with the networking hardware community, uh, the PC NICs, wire, Ethernet ne network cards, wireless network cards, uh, home gateway and router vendors to support IPv6. Um, we do a lot of work in Windows to actually offload functionality into the network card. We actually work very closely with the hardware vendors where some aspects of TCP uh, processing actually get done in hardware. And one of our principles has been to work with the hardware community to ensure that the hardware supports IPv4 and IPv6 in parallel as well. Again, one of our themes in looking at the client was that we don't want a customer to have a choice between performance with IPv4 and functionality of IPv6. Right? We wanted to ensure that there was equivalent performance. So we have, in fact, worked with the hardware community to support IPv6 in network cards, support IPv6 in Wi-Fi and mobile broadband infrastructure. Um, we also have, we have logo programs in place that actually require that a Windows-compatible PC have IPv6-capable hardware sitting underneath it. We also have logo programs around home gateways. So home router vendors who are Windows-compatible actually are required to support IPv6, um, at least to ensure that transition technologies work correctly. Um, so we wanted to, again, make sure that, again, consumers, customers don't have to think about IPv6 when they're buying a, a set of modern networking gear. So it goes beyond the software. It goes be to, to the hardware itself. Finally, it's about preparing the end user. So they might have a Windows compat a IPv6 compatible operating system and an IPv6-capable PC, and maybe even an IPv6-capable router. But end-to-end, -end, the user's connectivity has to actually work. Um, there's a link here to a blog post that we put out, um, to our blog earlier, uh, actually went out yesterday. Um, and on that blog post is a little embedded tool that helps you test whether or not you've got working IPv6 connectivity. Um, and in, in fact, if you don't, it gives you instructions on how you can fix things if there's a, pro if there's a potential problem with dual stacked IPv4 and IPv6 content. So we've taken, again, the approach of uh, making sure the end user is empowered to, to have the level of connectivity that they expect. So we've taken the approach of looking at the client, the, 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 the operating system, the hardware, the end user experience, the, the home gateway, um, and making sure that it's, that part of the ecosystem is ready. The next phase is really looking at infrastructure and applications. And it turns out that this is actually far more difficult. Because with the operating system, I could simply have a set of engineers go and build a bunch of IPv6 code, and we could actually test it and ship it. With infrastructure and applications, we're talking about millions 
of applications that need to be updated and upgraded and modified to be able to run on IPv6 enabled networks. We started with our own infrastructure. So we started with our own, beyond the networking stack, we started with looking at everything that's in Windows Server and all the applications that Microsoft produces. Um, one of the things that we wanted to make sure of is, of course, your basic network infrastructure works. So our DHCP and DNS servers, remote access servers, Active Directory, print servers, all the basic building blocks of an enterprise network uh, would be enabled with IPv6. So that you could actually start rolling out an IPv6-based network without having to, again, um, compromise on functionality. We then moved to applications. And actually, at this point, pretty much um, every major suite that we produce is actually IPv6 capable. Um, so Office, Exchange, uh, our web server, SQL. Um, this actually became a company-wide commitment. Uh, we were one of the first companies that actually declared that, in fact, um, all applications that we produce will have a roadmap toward IPv6. We have a set of common engineering criteria that all of our engineers across the company have to follow. And we actually baked IPv6 into those common engineering criteria. So our engineers are required now, as part of their engineering, to explicitly think about IPv6 and V4 and V6 uh, parallelism as part of product design, product planning, and product uh, testing. Um, there are some products that aren't quite there yet, um, but Everything is on the roadmap to get there. And certainly all of our major suites are there at this point. But as I said before, it's a lot more difficult than that. We can solve it for our own applications, but there are literally millions of applications out there. And so we had to take a much broader approach to really thinking about what it takes to enable V6-based uh, applications. Um, it turns out that when we were looking at the, uh, when we were looking at what was out there in 2001, every bit of guidance that existed, um, all of our own guidance, every third, all the third-party guidance, was to build IPv4 applications. So we had an ecosystem that had been trained to build IPv4, and we had to move that ecosystem along. If we didn't move that ecosystem along, then no customer could realistically think about an IPv6 migration without risk of compatibility, or at least uh, the risk of some problems popping up over time. So we started by looking at our low-level APIs, WinSOC, or our sockets-based API, and provided clear developer guidance on how to build IP-agnostic applications. Um, that's actually on our IPv6 website. There's a lot of details there on how to build WinSOC and sockets applications that are IPv6 agnostic. And more importantly, what we did is remove all of our samples that are IPv4 only. We made sure that every piece of guidance that we provided was about doing dual stack applications. And then we realized that, in fact, the real problem is that developers shouldn't think about this stuff. Like, you're writing an application v4, v6, it's all a bunch of numbers and letters, and nobody really cares. Right. So what we actually said is, you know what? We're going to look at things like our .NET framework and our web services stack and simply make it agnostic to v4 and v6. So that the application developer builds good IP agnostic applications by default. So we simply decided to hide v4 and v6 from the developer so they could focus on building great dual stacked applications and not become IP addressing experts along the way. So a lot of our current guidance actually says that users or admin developers don't manipulate IP addresses. We give them interfaces for looking up names and connecting. Right? And we guide them away from manipulating IP addresses. We guide them away from thinking about all the different network interfaces that are on the client. We guide them away from trying to decide which is the best interface. We just say, give us the name of a resource you want to connect to and connect to it. And we'll take care of figuring out how to get that connection to work for you. Uh, we'll give you a connection back in, in return. Today, IPv4 applications still exist. They haven't all gone away. Um, but the vast majority of applications out there 
now have support for dual v4 and v6, uh, a vast majority. That doesn't mean that those are deployed. It actually turns out that many, many customers are still running old versions of those applications that are IPv4 only. But the vast majority of the developer ecosystem has at least now supports uh, dual stack. We uh, within Microsoft actually are running uh, a dual stack v6 network and have for quite some time. And in fact, one of the things that we've been testing is how much, how far away are we from being able to run a complete v6 only network. It actually turns out that of the thousands of applications, either line of business applications or third party applications, we had only a handful that we really ended up having to worry about. Um, the vast majority we actually had capable, uh, v6 capa capabilities built on, uh, IPv6 capabilities already enabled, and there were a small number of exceptions that we had to handle. Um, so we think that with the exception of internal line of business applications, most applications are ready. The other thing that has gotten in the way has been uh, the in infrastructure. Um, and in fact, one of the things that we found is that, <coughs> excuse me, that one of the blockers to being able to deploy IPv6 content and scenarios had been all the network hardware that was in the network, load balancers and routers and uh, IDS systems, and IPS systems. In fact, we looked at IPv, putting out some IPv6 content about four or five years ago. And we sat down with our network operations group to do the analysis. And it was very clear that we just didn't have the infrastructure in place that would allow us to do it. Um, we didn't have the load balancers. The CDNs, the uh, content delivery networks, were just not there. Um, we just could not, we, the, the, the infrastructure, the ecosystem just wasn't ready. We've come a long way since then. Um, today, Akamai and Limelight are supporting IPv6 based on a lot of a pressure uh, that has been put out there to get IPv6 running. Um, nowadays, load balances generally work with IPv6. A lot of the core infrastructure, the routing algorithms, are actually not creating a performance penalty for IPv6 traffic. We're not perfect yet, but today, as we look at where we are, it's actually possible to roll out an IPv6 service and not have to rely on a set of custom code to make it happen. And that's a huge advance in the last several years. The third step was really looking at content. And as I mentioned, five years ago when we looked at content, it just wasn't possible. Um, today, as I said, the world has gotten a lot better. Um, today, we're actually rolling out, we've got uh, four services that are currently running uh, v6 only. Um, Bing, uh, Microsoft.com, Xbox.com, our advertising portal for advertisers. And in fact, actually, Xbox.com is going to be uh, staying with IPv6 permanently. Uh, and we're, st we're assessing the, the other three based on the results of today's tests. It's an interesting, you know, a, a little bit of perspective on how we look at this. There's always this, uh, those of you who are econo economists uh, will recognize the problem here, which is that you, we have a challenge in that, that nobody wants to put out IPv6 content because there's no clients and no infrastructure ready to do it. And nobody wants to invest in the clients and the infrastructure unless there's actually content. And so I think one of the interesting takeaways from the last six to nine months and the run-up to IPv6 day is that, in fact, it actually breaks that logjam. It actually has created an environment where it's actually OK to put up IPv6 content. And I think that we're starting to create some momentum here around trying to move the rest of the internet along, uh, getting the internet, getting the ISP, getting the v6 infrastructure in the network itself along with the content at the same time. Um, I'll tell you that a lot of people have their fingers crossed. We've been monitoring uh, lots and lots of data feeds uh, just to see how things are going. So far, things seem to be going okay. 
Um, but I think that knowing that things work is going to be a big uh, is going to be a big help to really uh, understanding what the long you know what the next steps are going to be in the in the IPv6 deployment. So. I think the big takeaway when we look at the, I, the content that's out there on IPv6 day today is that in some sense the 10 years of investment that have taken place so far are actually working. That we have the clients, we have the infrastructure, we have some applications, we have servers and content, and they actually act work end to end. And that's, a great, that's a great accomplishment, it's a testimony of the entire technology community. So let me switch gears a little bit and talk about what's next. Um, what are the problems that we're seeing today? What are the issues we faced? And what are the things for you to be watching out for as you're looking at IPv6? I will tell you that today, despite all of the industry's best efforts to deploy IPv6, we still have a long way to get it right. Um, there's a bunch of issues that, people that we still have to get uh, solved. Um, one problem, I have a person on my team who keeps referring to IPv6 brokenness as the world's biggest problem. And the fundamental issue is that there are situations where the client can get fooled into thinking there's IPv6 connectivity when there really isn't. Um, so we see infrastructure that will tell the client or signal to the client that there's IPv6 routability. And it turns out that when the client tries to send IPv6 traffic, it gets dropped on the floor. Right. One of the problems, that I, one of the advantages of what we, what we did is we said, well, we prefer IPv6 over IPv4. The problem with that is if IPv6 is advertised but doesn't work, then in fact we don't use IPv4 because the IP we thought the IPv6 should be working. So we've actually been working with a number of industry players uh, within the IETF to define a set of improvements that make it possible for the client to actually detect whether or not, not just whether it has IPv6, but whether the IPv6 connectivity actually works end to end. Um, so that we can make a smarter decision, uh, we can define ways to make smarter decisions about what, uh, whether to really use and rely on IPv6 or fall back to IPv4. Uh, or ideally to even decide whether to use, which, connect, which type of connection is better. So we need to address this, this issue of brokenness. Um, it can be fixed in the home routers. It can also be fixed um, through the client. It can be fixed through the ISP. So there are a lot of different ways that this can be addressed. Um, there is today very limited support for IPv6 in home networks. Um, people hate transition technologies. We hate transition technologies. They are cumbersome and difficult and complex and ugly and um, but you know what they're needed but reality is that most customers today do not have IPv6 connectivity to the internet they have at best good IPv4 and as more and more content finds its way into IPv6 and I expect that some content will start being IPv6 only over, t over the next several years there will be a lot of users who will simply not be able to access that content unless they can rely on those transition technologies. I think the call to action here really comes down to making sure that we accelerate and deliver the IPv6 connectivity to the end user as quickly as possible, not just relying on those transition technologies. But I expect transition technologies to be around for quite some time. It will take a while for all home networks to be upgraded to v6. And as I mentioned, we still have software and hardware out there that is still running v4. Um, you know, one of the things that is important to keep in mind is that there's a long way from a standard being developed to a standard being deployed and in active use. Uh, a, the standard has to be implemented, products have to get built, enterprises have to buy it, enterprises have to deploy it, and users have to be using it. And that can take five years, 10 years, sometimes 20 years. And so it's important to realize that even today, 
there are going to be a lot of enterprises who aren't going to be ready for quite some time. Um, even if they wanted to move to IPv6, they just can't. Um, and it's not because of all the investments in the technology community. It's that buying cycles take time. Uh, investment, it takes time to upgrade. It takes money to upgrade. And so we think it's going to take time. We don't think it's that hard. But, we, don't, but we're not, we know that the industry, the customer base, is simply not ready yet. So IPv6, we're in great shape, but we're not there all the way yet. There's still some issues, to, technical issues to solve. There's some deployment issues to solve. And um, we've got to get more of it out there. I think that one of the things that I would also take away from IPv6 Day is that we've demonstrated the value of having content that actually supports IPv4 and IPv6, but what we haven't done is really crack the nut beyond thinking about IPv6 as kind of an experimental thing to IPv6 becoming the mainstream way that people work. And there's a few things that are going to have to happen before we start really thinking about IPv6 as the dominant way that people work. Obviously, we need to get IPv6 out to customers. Several speakers this morning talked about work that's going on to get there. But it goes beyond that. It's not enough to put up some web servers and have them be on IPv6. The requirement is going to be that content actually is the same on IPv4 and IPv6. There has to be equivalence. Um, you have to take the approach that customers don't compromise when they move to an IPv6 only world or an IPv6 preferred world. It's not just that they can access content, it's that they can access for all the content they want to get to. And then businesses actually need to start preparing to deploy. And it's not just providing IPv6 to the edge of a customer, it's about getting IPv6 into the hand of a desktop user uh, inside the network. And it takes years, in many cases, years of planning to get there. Some of the lessons that we've learned as part of preparing for our own, for doing our own internal IPv6 deployment over the last five, six years is are to start early with training. We had to train a lot of people on IPv6, how to think about it, how to deploy it, how to manage it, how to... Um, how to uh, do address management, subnet management, support. There's a lot of people who are affected by a change of this type. Tested in the lab. Um, one of the things that I always recommend to enterprise customers is to build a great application inventory. You'd be amazed at how many people have no idea what applications are actually running. And one of the things that we found we had to do was actually build a big inventory of every application that we're running. We didn't even find them all. Um, only after we turned it on did we start finding applications that didn't work. Um, but build an application inventory so you can try and assess what works and what doesn't work. Phased deployments work best. Um, we, um, we started out trying to do a, something much more, uh, I guess in retrospect, sounded uh, much more ridiculous. We started out by trying to actually do turn it on much more globally, and then actually pulled back and did a much more phased deployment. And what we did is we did it in two phases. We turned on ISATAP, a transition IPv6 over v4 transition technology first, and then migrated to native IPv6 second. So we've done, we've kind of moved from v4 to, dual, to a tunneled v4 to a, dual, to a dual stack model. And we're starting to begin the process of looking at um, what it will take for us to simply turn off v4 in different parts of our network. Um, again, we want to understand what it takes and how hard it's going to really be for customers to do the same thing. So a phased approach works. Um, enable v6 on all machines and don't turn it off. Um, there's a lot of people who want to turn off IPv6 support on the client. And we find that that actually is usually driven out of fear rather than an actual real technical problem. Um, there are some issues that some customers run into, but making sure that v6 is actually enabled on all machines, even if you haven't done the infrastructure rollout, is still important. Move to use, use native v6 if you can, and 
Um, what we've generally found that is if you've turned on v6 on the client and, it were, and you're kind of doing a phased migration, most users won't even notice it. Um, but you've got to have a support infrastructure and the processes in place to make that happen. So I've talked a lot about IPv6 and the migration to v6 on the client and the content and the infrastructure, the applications, enterprises doing deployment, um, what it takes to get the support out uh, beyond IPv6 data to make IPv6 great. But I want to come back a little bit and talk about what our real goal here is. Because I think one of the things that's often lost in the conversation when we talk about IPv6 is we think about IPv6 because of address shortage. When, you, when I ask somebody, why are you deploying IPv6? First, they'll tell me they're not. And second, they'll tell me, well, you know, eventually I'm going to run out of IP addresses. And I think that, in general, that's a very dangerous way to think about it. Um, it's, an, it's an easy way to think about it. And it's great that we get lots of addresses. But I think we can do better. I think what, what's, what we don't talk about enough is how IPv6 can actually make life better. How it can enable you to be more effective and do more things. So I want to give you some thoughts about some of the things that IPv6 enables and how we've actually used IPv6 as a building block to build new scenarios that actually create new, new value propositions for users and enterprises. Because at the end of the day, if you're going to do an IPv6 migration, you'd like to get something out of it that goes beyond simply getting more addresses. So I, my argument is that IPv6 is, in fact, better than IPv4, and not just because of addresses. It's better because it gives you the ability to do uh, logical zone networks. That transparency that you get by having every client have its own unique IP address lets you do smarter things about managing how your network is actually laid out and who can talk to whom in your network. Um, I'll talk about logical zoning in a little bit more detail in a moment. It lets you do smarter access control with policy that lets you control who can access whom and where traffic can go. It includes IPsec as a built-in capability. And it gives you the ability to actually do end-to-end -end encryption and authentication and uh, authorization. And you can actually simplify your traffic management, especially, again, with that transparency that comes of addressing. Um, let me give you a few examples, just to give you a sense of sort of what I'm talking about and how you can think about IPv6 as an enabler of new capability, not just as a, a source of new addresses. Um, a solution we offer is something called server and domain isolation. And the idea here is to use IPsec to create domains of trust among devices, among, server, among servers, and among clients in order to, to create isolation to create an isolation boundary, a logical isolation boundary, based on user identity. The idea here is to take your network and segment it using policy based on the server resources you've got and the users and the group and different users and user groups. I'll give you two examples. You might do something like server isolation where I take a server, which is a high-value server, and I put a policy in place that says, the only people who are allowed to send traffic to that server, to that physical server, are people in this particular user group. Okay? And at the network layer, using IPsec and using user authentication inside IPsec, we can actually enforce who can, access, who can even send traffic to that server. You might do access control and authorization within your application, on your web, app, on your web server. But at a network layer, you can actually physically block bad traffic from getting to that server. And essentially isolate that server to a particular class of users. Okay? And having visibility into the client's IP address and then authorization using IPsec gives you that ability to create that isolation boundary around your server based on the policy that you want to put in place. <clears throat> you can take that a step further and do domain isolation, where I can take an entire group of users, maybe all your employees, maybe it's all of your servers, and you can actually create a logical boundary around that set of users and servers, and say, you know, if, I want, if this user wants to talk to this other user, 
Well, that's great, but that communication will again have to be IPsec protected and use user identity as a hard proof point that that authorization is allowed, that communication is allowed to take place. So a user can actually be protected from random people on the network because simply the traffic gets blocked at the network layer by policy. So if I'm sitting on a public network, the only people who are allowed to access my machine who can reach me are people who are uh, in the same user group as me. And that's actually a pretty powerful concept because I, in fact, could be part of multiple logical networks at the same time. Right? So I could be, um, I could be an engineer separate from the finance department, but if I'm the CEO, I might be able to talk to both the engineering and the finance groups. And so I can create these logical boundaries and then put users into one or the other boundary or both. And that's a pretty powerful concept. We, go beyond, we think about this beyond that. It's not just about who can access what, but it's also about the health of a client. Can you put policy in place that controls whether or not the client that's connecting to you is in fact healthy? Um, so take a solution called Network Access Protection, or NAP, and think about using IPsec and the capabilities of IPv6 to not only control who you can access, but in fact require that everybody who's accessing your server proves to that server that they are in fact healthy. They are running antivirus software, that the antivirus signatures are up to date, that they're, com that they're compatible with other policies that you want to have, that they're currently up to date and patched. And so in fact, using identity, authentication, and authorization, you can not only test who's accessing you, but whether that person who's accessing you is in fact a security risk and a health risk to your network. Another way, way that we've used IPv6 is in an area that I call reperimeterization. Um, one of the interesting things that comes out of IPv6 is this ability for, because everything has a unique address or can have a unique address, it allows us to really rethink what a network boundary really is. I've given you a couple of examples. Logical boundaries based on user identity, or logical boundaries based on uh, user group, or logical boundaries based on health. But here's another pivot. If I talk to an IT manager, typical network manager today, and I say, what's your network? They will first look at me funny and say, well, that's a funny question. Um, because they'll say, well, of course my network is my switches and routers and my firewall and my infrastructure. That's my network. Well, I argue that that's in fact the old way of thinking about a network. That your network used to be your buildings. It used to be where your, it used to be the stuff you owned. The problem is that that's not how your users think about it anymore. Right? Users are mobile. Users are everywhere. Um, and from a security point of view and a compliance point of view and a help desk point of view, the real question is not where is your building, it's where are your users. And so one of the things that we typically t talk to customers about and uh, talk to uh, about now is that your network is not your buildings, your network is where your users are. And how do you think about your network as being a logical network that can actually extend out beyond your building to the users and their machines, no matter where they happen to be? Now, that becomes a really interesting problem. Because once you can reach out, or once you can reach out and see that machine, no matter where it happens to be, then you can manage it, then you can support it, you can patch it, you can, you can help the user. And you can ensure that user is always in compliance with various policies that you want to have in place. One thing that we did uh, in Windows 7 is we introduced a technology called direct access. The idea behind direct access was to provide a VPN alternative, a way for the user to get an always-on connection into the enterprise, and the way for the enterprise to be able to get an always-on manageability channel back to the client. And we use IPv6 and IPsec as the building blocks to make that happen. Why? 
Because the problem in an IPv4 only world is that I can't guarantee that every client, no matter where it happens to be, is going to have a unique address. And so what we wanted to do is make sure that when the client is out there, no matter what network it's on, I can reach out to it. My management software can patch it. My antivirus software can see it. My compliance software can reach out to it. And so we use IPv6 as the underlying building block to ensure that clients connecting into the enterprise are uniquely addressable no matter where they happen to be. So we redefined the corporate boundary to be where the users are and where the devices are. We use IPv6 addresses to ensure that every device has a unique address at any given time. And we then use that as a basis to allow various applications and infrastructure to manage the user, as well as to ensure that the user can actually access enterprise resources without having to bring up a VPN. So when I boot my laptop and I'm at home, I can access the intranet applications and file shares without having to launch a VPN because I'm always connected to the corporate network. Um, I also can access the internet, and I don't even have to send all my internet traffic into the corporate network. That can go directly, but only my corporate traffic goes into the corporate network, but it's always on and always there. To give you a sense of how this works and how we used IPv6 to make this happen, um, here's a network diagram uh, that, that, that demonstrates this. You, what you have is a, a data center, uh, your, typical, your existing applications and services, and what we do is we put in front of that a direct access server. Uh, direct access server basically adds, provides a bridge between the internet and the data center and your enterprise resources. What you have is a client that's sitting out there on an existing IPv4 network, typically. And what it's doing is it's establishing an IPv, IPsec session into the enterprise network. We, in fact, create two sessions, one for the machine, so as soon as a machine boots, it sets up a session uh, into the enterprise over which management can take place. And then when the user logs in, we establish a second session for the user that the user can use for their applications or that we use to send user traffic over. So we've got one connection that's always there and one connection that's there when the user is logged in. And the idea here is that we basically set up, we use IPsec to set up that security association as part of that negotiation, we give the client, or we ensure the client gets an IPv6 address, and we register that IPv6 address into the corporate DNS server. So that when I'm sitting at the help desk and the, and the user calls up and says, hey, I need help, I get their machine name and I can actually find their address, and it's an IPv6 address, and I can simply connect to that client if I need to. So in an ideal world, and I'll tell you about the, I'll tell you that the world is not yet ideal. In an ideal world, in this deparameterized world, what you have is end-to-end -end IPv6, right? So you've got IPv6 on the internet, you've got IPv6 in the corporate network, you've got IPsec deployed everywhere, and I can simply boot my laptop as a Windows 7 client, I can send IPv6, IPsec traffic through the network, um, and it'll go to the corporate web server, corporate line of business server that I want to access. And I don't have to think about it. It's all great. And maybe you have a little bit of packet control at the edge uh, of your network to just do denial of service prevention and some traffic shaping. Very simple model. And you kind of say, well, you know, in this end state, my network architecture is very simple. All my connectivity is simply end-to-end -end from clients to servers based on, based on user identity and access. The problem is that the internet isn't quite there yet. Uh, it's going to be a little while for it to be there. So we ended up having to actually solve this problem by layering software on top of it. So let me just give you a sense of kind of so how we approached it. We said, in fact, most customers have not deployed IPsec everywhere, and most customers have not deployed, and most of the internet is not running IPv6. So in fact, what we do is if a client creates, this, in this case, let me just assume that the application server is running IPv6, um, just for a moment. My client is going to create an IPv6 packet. We're going to encapsulate it in an IPsec tunnel. 
We then encapsulate the IPsec tunnel and put it inside an IPv4 tunnel, send it over the internet, crack open the IPv4 tunnel to get the IPsec traffic out, take out, break open the IPsec traffic, and send raw, tra raw IPv4, uh, IPv6 traffic to the application server. Lots of encapsulation and decapsulation, but it allows us to basically get the traffic from the client to the server on top of the existing v4 infrastructure. And the whole idea here is that we want to get to that end state that I described in the previous slide, but we're going to do it um, by layering in the IPv4 stuff, layering in the IPsec tunnel termination, recognizing those are really meant to be temporary fixes until the internet and the customers actually migrate to a IPv6 and IPsec world. In fact, we recognize that most application servers aren't actually running IPv6, and so we provide a gateway solution that, tunnel, that translate IPv6 back to IPv4 for those application servers that are running IPv4 only. So the way to think about what we've done here is we kind of take a fresh look at the internet and said, in an ideal world, we would like to see IPv6 and IPsec giving you great end-to-end -end connectivity, and then we're going to layer in a way of doing something similar by adding software in as a band-aid to the ideal. Um, so it's kind of a reinvention, a rethinking of how connectivity should work in an IPv6 world. That's very different than the point of view that a lot of people take today, which is I said, well, I've got an IPv4 only world, and I want to layer in band-aids of v6 in order to get to v6. We wanted to basically help customers move to an IPv6 world by providing transition over to v6. There's a similar model here for customers who have IPsec end-to-end -end but don't have uh, um, v6 connectivity over the internet. So once you have IPsec enabled, we can simply avoid one level of encapsulation and get the traffic over to the enterprise. We hide most of this stuff. Uh, all of these servers and infrastructure are actually baked into a single server. So you buy a single, you deploy a single server, and all of this tunneling and encapsulation happens for you. So as an administrator, you don't have to think about all of this stuff. But the idea is that we've actually tried to design this in a way that as the network matures and moves toward closer and closer to v6, you simply start turning things off and getting better and better performance as you move toward a more native v6 world. So in summary, I want to leave you with a few points. It has taken us 10 years. Uh, the standards have been around even longer, but it has taken us about 10 years of investment to get to where we are today. Um, and IPv6 Day is a huge accomplishment for the technology community to be able to get to this point. We have a long way to go. We've got to get the v6 issues deploy, uh, addressed. We have to get IPv6 actually rolled out. Um, and it's going to take some time. We have to get the content ready. We have to have real content that's actually desirable content that's actually giving you parity between v6 and v4. It's important to keep in mind that the deployment of IPv6 is more than simply giving out router advertisements and supporting addressing. It is a change to the way people design, build, manage, and monitor and support networks. And I can't emphasize enough that for most enterprise customers, there is a long distance from a standard being developed to an enterprise customer actually being deployed. It takes a lot of moving parts to make it successful. Part of that is it's not just about deploying infrastructure. It's about applications, tools, training, and so on. It takes a community of investment across the technology industry to make this happen. And it's important to keep in mind that that community is a very difficult and complex ecosystem to, to move. And then it's very difficult for customers to actually buy and adopt new technology. So, you know, one of the things that's always hard, I'm an impatient person. It's very hard to, be, to, to look at this and say, wow, it's taken us 10 years to get here. But 
transitions of this magnitude take time, and they're hard to get right. Um, and it's amazing that we've actually gotten as far as we have gotten. And then the last thing I want to say, point out, leave you with is it is important for us to think about IPv6 as a technology that goes beyond giving us addresses. It's about you've got to create value from the migration to IPv6, not just addresses. And I think one of the, certainly our perspective is looking at things like policy, logical network boundaries, identity, um, remote access, seamless connectivity, are ways to create value from the migration that go beyond simply giving out addresses. I think when you really look at what it's going to take to move customers to deploying IPv6, that value is going to be the real linchpin. So we're very optimistic about IPv6. We're very excited. There's a lot of work to do, and uh, we're, we're certainly uh, excited to be a big part of it today. I've got a link here to um, our uh, IPv6 website, which has lots of tools and resources, developer guidance, deployment guidance, uh, solutions that are both in Windows and provided by third parties for IPv6. And with that, I, think, uh, I thank you for your time and attention today, and I think we've got time for a few questions. Så, frågor? Questions? No? Okay. How much, how much of this is available on Windows Mobile? Uh, at this point, mo many of our consumer offerings, uh, Windows Mobile and Xbox, are, uh, still in the, are still working through their plans for IPv6. So right now, uh, there's very little IPv6 support available on either phone or Xbox, but uh, I know that we are actively working on it. No more questions? Oh, yeah. I will have. Um, so there are new, a lot of work uh, creating new standards and protocols and so on for IPv6 that might not have been done yet. Um, would you say that uh, those might be implemented in uh, like the next service packs and so on for Vista, or will that pure, will it be more likely to just come in future Windows versions, or what's the general policy on getting more functionality into existing Windows? Great question. Um, we look at this on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, in fact, you know, what you're asking is a very difficult question because we, it actually wraps into two different problems that we have to look at. One is which standards are actually going to get deployed. Um, so we do an assessment of, the sta of each standard to see, okay, is this going to have momentum to get deployed? Should we be aggressively pushing it? Should we be, do we think customers are going to be pushing it? Um, so that's one side of a question. And then we look at the timeline. Uh, what is the timeline in which something is going to get adopted? Is this a 10-year thing or a two-year thing? Then we finally have to look at the engineering complexity in terms of whether we can even take it. Uh, to down-level version of Windows. In many cases, it becomes extremely difficult. Um, and so we look at it case by case. Um, generally speaking, we try and push uh, new investments, new capabilities into newer versions of Windows, but we have taken things down-level in the past, and we certainly will do so in the future uh, based on custom demand and, and uh, adoption. <laughs>